Yeah, I'm ready. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Am I in frame? Because I'm not really going to be able to see myself. So for a tiny yeah. head. Wow. Don't, gonna don't say anything. That. No. Gonna open up the song. <laughs> Someone gets out. I hope that someone gets out. I hope that someone gets out. Message in the podcast. I should have known. I should have known. Message in the podcast. It's like yin and yang. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Welcome to the Bullshit Filter on video. Hello, everyone. How you doing? How you doing? Yeah. I don't know why we're I doing mean, it on video, but we can, so we yeah, are. That's right. I'm Stan. I'd like to introduce Barry. Uh, we I'm hope Barry. to have a good time with you. Yeah, for the <laughs> next hour. Am I Barry and Bear? These? Those are his nipples. Oh, I mean, love, Agrippa. Love cheek nipples. <laughs> Bullshit Filter episode 80, uh, Bullshit Filter the News episode 80, Ray, um, nothing yeah. going on in the world, so I'm not I really can't sure. Think, why are we here? I can't yeah, think what of do, anything. What are we doing? Nothing going on. All right, on. good show, everybody. See you next week. <laughs> well, let's start with an email. Uh, Bob Sullivan, longtime listener, um, right. say, asked me, sent me an email this morning, he says, what do you think about Biden? Yeah. What do I think about? Well, I think I've been very clear on the show over the years about what I think about Joe Biden. Um, yes. Look, you got to read between the lines with Joe Biden. Um, right. He has been, well, before he was vice president and president elect, he was the senator from Delaware from 1972 until 2008. Oh, no. <laughs> nice. Hey, Jack. How's you got going? the Biden, got the Biden glasses on. <laughs> yeah. Just shut yeah, up. Sorry. Just shut up, man. <laughs> shut up. What a clown. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, uh, now, Delaware, uh, as we've discussed when we did our shows on the Panama Papers and on, you know, tax evasion and uh, uh, ways of hiding money. Mm -hmm. When the Panama Papers thing came out, oh, let me turn my amp off. When the Panama Papers and the other one came out, um, the Virgin Island Papers, I think. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that surprised people is that uh, there weren't many Americans showing up, and mostly British and European and African dictators right. and third world dictators and that kind of stuff. We don't Queen. we don't do that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you don't do that kind of stuff in America because you have Delaware. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you have Delaware. So Delaware, yeah. and there's plenty of stuff out there on this. It's it's the most corrupt state in the union, uh, uh, purely mm. from the perspective of the dodgy secret shit that goes on in Delaware with people being able to hide their yeah. criminal activities uh, using shelf companies and that kind of stuff. And Biden's been the senator from there uh, for, for decades, was the senator there from decades. Right. Very, you know, uh, closely involved, you would have to think, in what's going mm -hmm. on there. So we yeah. know that about him. Um, whether or not you believe it, uh, the guy who wrote the book, um, I Paint Houses. I Paint Houses? No, something, something Paint Houses. Um, do you paint houses? I think it was it that the, the Irishman Scorsese's film was based right. on the, the character that wrote the book, a uh, real life character, mo mobbed up uh, enforcer, and you know, Jimmy Hoffa's right hand man may, you know, according to his own testimony, 
he assassinated Jimmy Hoffa on orders from the mob. Uh, he wrote in his book, didn't make it into the film, but he wrote in his book that uh, 1972, uh, when he was running uh, one of the unions for the mob in Delaware, mm -hmm. um, the uh, Biden campaign, Biden was running for his first term, uh, first successful attempt, right. approached him about shutting down a newspaper that was going to be running a, a negative story on Biden and some of his dodgy activities. Right. And he did. Uh, Frank, I think his name is, uh, used his union to basically shut down the newspaper for a week and wow. stop that edition coming out the week before the election because he believed that Joe Biden would be better for the working man, he said. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, so if, if he's to be believed and look, as I said, he's a mob enforcer, so possibly not, but yeah. uh, you got to wonder why he would lie. Like this book came out 20 years ago when Biden was still just a Senator, even long before he was vice president, why would he make it up? Who knows? It's sort of a bizarre story to make up. There's no glory in it it's not like i killed jimmy hoffa okay I, right. maybe he made that up for the glory um yeah. but you know i stopped a newspaper coming out to help joe biden get elected yeah. i know he didn't make a big deal i've said he met, never met biden himself mm -hmm. um like, but, would, uh, yeah it doesn't work that way i no. i have i have to admit i don't really know anything about biden except for a couple of things one there was a uh, story on him when he first was elected to congress or whatever it was house i guess maybe it was the house before the senate i honestly don't know and it talked about he made a big deal of not moving to washington that he would take the train every day from his house or from wherever to uh to where he had to go and that was somehow a big deal he would sit there and he would ride on the train and he would talk to people and i'm sure he was touching them in very eerie ways but um so he was supposedly a man of the people or man for the people so you have this common touch thing which is a good story he was one of the youngest people ever elected to congress that's a great story but then you've got the omni crime bill that we talked about um uh, when we were doing our uh, war on drugs series so uh hard ass really put you know a bill that really came down hard on non-whites um for, for having drugs or using drugs or selling drugs. And then this man of the people. So for me, he's all over the place, but for me, he's just a typical politician. He bided man, his time. He's man, man of the white people, right? Man white of the people, white yeah. people. My you people, know. the man yeah. of my people. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So um, yeah, so I, I think he's just a typical politician. He plays the game well. He he, he bided his time. He was selected oh, by Obama. Oh, bided his, so, time. He bided his time? He bided his time? his time, yes. He just bided his time, yeah. man. <laughs> Yeah, and when when uh, Obama needed his own older white guy to to discount uh, McCain, he goes to Biden, and it worked out for him. So um, hmm. I I don't think he's the savior that everybody thinks he is. I think he was just in the right place at the right time, and now he gets to be president, and we'll see what he's capable of. Yeah, and he and McCain were good friends too, which yes. made it harder for McCain to attack uh, right. Obama's Brilliant. ticket when he when he had an old friend of his. Yeah, so this the, the crime bill is a big thing. The 84 crime bill and the 94 mm -hmm. crime bill that he was the sponsor of both of those really did untold damage to millions of yes. mostly minority families in the US. Um, so look, it um, and then, then the whole Hunter Biden thing, <coughs> Joe saying he knew nothing about Hunter having the thing in the Ukraine. Eh, it's yeah. obviously, obviously bullshit. Yeah. Um, he knows. He knows. And then the whole he, people say, but where's his, if he's so corrupt, where's all of his money? Well, he's a senator from Delaware. Uh, they know how to hide money in Delaware. But is yes. there evidence outside of that that he's living large and he has? Uh, yeah, probably not. Not that I'm aware of. I haven't dug deep into it. Look, I, I think compared to Trump, I mean, anyone compared to Trump, right. Ted he Bundy does. compared to Trump's going to yeah. look good. Uh, you know. Exactly. Exactly. But um, do I think he's uh, going to do a good job? No. I, I Look, I think he's, as a politician, leaving aside his character and the, the smell, the whiff of corruption there. Yeah. Um, you know, he's pretty much uh, a mainstream centre-right Democrat, uh, probably is going to... I think be a little bit more aggressive militarily than Trump has been over the last four years. 
because yes. the Democrats always have this thing where they need to look tough and act tough, right. going back to Truman, we talked about exactly. in our Cold War show, needed exactly. to look tough because they get attacked from the right if they don't do that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of you know progressive uh, policies, economic policies, you can't expect too much from this guy uh he yeah. you know he's pretty much owned by the corporations have a look at what he did with student debt there's another sort of black mark against his name mm-hmm. when people were trying to remove student debt he came in on the side of the credit card companies and uh, put some legislation in place to defend them yeah. um so uh, yeah look i don't expect we're going to get much out of him whether or not the right. republicans still control the senate and you know we have to talk about the election we'll get more into that in a second but if the Republicans continue to control the Senate after the Georgia runoff, in, I think in January, mm-hmm. uh, runoffs January. Yep. in January, yep. um, like he's not going to be able to get anything done for at least two years. Even if he, he manages to win the Senate, Democrats manage to win the Senate, he's got two years of control of both houses. Right. Um, I don't think he's going to get much done. I mean, it, it reminds me a lot of when Obama became president, controlled the you know two houses control the Senate yeah. and the House, sorry, um, both both parts of Congress, uh, 2008 for two years, and uh, got nothing done right. uh, because but he it, had to deal with the GFC. Right, right. But also Primarily, I, I think. Exactly. And I just want to throw in there real quick. One, Biden doesn't have to do all that much. You and I could be elected president, but as long as we're not Trump, we're going to get a favorable favorable spin in the news. So there's that. And as far as Obama's first two years, I just remember that being a feel good time. The first black president, we were patting ourselves on the back because we weren't racist anymore. And he didn't have to do much. It was it was just a, an emotional victory. So again, Biden could cruise. He could really try. But either way, he's going to get a pass with a lot of the press because he's, like you said, not Trump. Yeah, he's going to get a pass and, um, you know, he's going to have to do, obviously, as he's said himself, his first order of business is going to be doing something about the coronavirus in the US, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But um, I I don't think he's got much chance of making much headway there. He's facing half of the country, which are red states. Even in the blue states, you've got a lot of red people that will say, my rights. If he right. tries to, you know, work with the governors to mandate masks or lockdowns, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, well, we'll get to it in a minute. I'll, I'll talk about what's yeah, happening yeah, yeah, in Australia yeah. in a second. Um, yeah. Bob also asked, has Trump destroyed peaceful succession in the USA? Um, well, mm. it, it remains to be seen um, what happens in January. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think that to to best answer that question, we have to wait to see how um, how much Biden's hands are tied coming into office to, you know, how much how hard was the transition for him? And if and it turns out to be he lost some serious weeks or whatever, as far as Corona or for anything else, then, yeah, people might say that Trump has damaged the transition. But I think it might be too early to tell uh, to answer that question yet. Yeah, we'll wait to see. I mean, certainly it's not a smooth uh, professional transition like you're used to seeing. Yeah. There um, will be a letter in the desk, in the resolution desk. There won't be a heartfelt letter saying, you know, here's your priorities. you got to put country first. I wish you all the luck. Not going to happen. There'll be, there'll be a dump There'll be a picture the of us. <laughs> <laughs> picture of a middle finger. Or, or Trump will jump up on the... Uh, xerox machine with his pants down xerox's ass and stick that in the desk that's what i would just burn the white house down and blame it on the mexicans um look bob asks are we the weimar republic in 1932 what's the view from down under well you know i've talked a lot about the view my the view from here uh i think generally speaking not just me crazy cam the communist but um Generally speaking, everyone in this country is looking at the U.S. thinking, you know, it, you're over. You've lost your right. damn minds. Um, it's but we a, don't know it. It's a disaster story. Yeah. Yeah, you don't know. It. Yeah, because yeah, you, you, you're, you're too deep down the hole, I think, yourselves. But I think yeah. everyone that I've spoken to here anyway, and everything I read in the media here is the U.S. has uh, gone batshit crazy. And... Um, 
we're just waiting to see what happens, I guess. But I, there is a there is a lot of talk here about we we need to disengage from the U.S. Yeah. and engage tighter with China. Problem being that our current administration uh, lumped itself in holus bolus with Trump, and right. is pissed off China so much that China's just cutting off all of its Australian imports one by one, uh, and making us bleed. Um, so you need just the to US. like. Well, to compensate, mm, maybe. Yeah, we okay. just signed yeah. a thing called the RCEP uh, in the last week. It's like this global trade deal that was the successor mm -hmm. to the TPP that we talked about on the show many years ago. Um, Trump uh, axed the TPP for from the American perspective when he got into mm -hmm. office. Um, and Clinton had sort of started to distance herself from it too during her campaign. Right. We just signed it with pretty much every country in the world except the US, the RCEP, and China is one of the signatories to it. So on one hand, they're cutting off all their trade with us. On the other hand, we just signed a new trade agreement with them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are there are ways for them to still put pressure on us. But the general view is that we need to, and you know, I felt this way for a long time. We need to get closer to China and... Yeah. Um, uh, you know, one of our prime ministers 30 years ago famously, Paul Keating famously said, we're an Asian country. We're in Asia. We need Good to point. think Asian. We need to be Asian. We're not, uh, you, you know, we've got to stop thinking of ourselves as a European nation. We're, a, right. we're an Asian nation. Yeah. Deal, deal, with the, uh, deal with the reality of your location. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's start with the um, election recap then, Ray. Um, mm. we, we, we did a bit of a live show on election day. Obviously, um, right. nothing really surprising happened, uh, although it did look for a while there that Trump might be in the lead. Um, yeah. but like those, we, we, well, yeah. we always kind of suspected, certainly the analysts had been saying for a couple of weeks prior to the election that the mail-in votes were going to be mostly Democrat and you had to wait mm -hmm. till they came in and were counted to, to really get a sense for where it was going. And, and um, I guess the big surprising thing for me is the lack of violence and incidents around the country on election day. Uh, it did, yeah. There were indications that it might get a little bit, uh, a little bit dangerous, but uh, I haven't seen really many reports at all. Yeah, well, like you, you probably saw the news reports of uh, businesses in major cities um, putting boards over their windows. And like I told you, the, the and I live in the middle of nowhere, we have more cows than people. But even the local um, volunteers... Which is a good thing for your sex life, but not it's, good it's, for, you know, exactly. functional services. Yeah, Exactly. Hey, you know, you it's go where you move the cows there. are. Right, yeah. it's pretty much why I looked up cow capital... And it was here. But um, all the people who normally volunteer for the elections, they all did not show up. And so the local electoral board, whatever it's called, had to scramble and get other people. And so even those people who were 50 percent Trump, 50 percent uh, Biden were expecting some kind of violence or trouble. And sure enough, uh, so they go out. But but I went to elect. I uh, went to vote in the morning. Heather went at lunchtime. There was no problem. But I think I think the news reports of the potential violence, we scared ourselves. We scared ourselves into not doing anything because, you know, that governor was almost kidnapped and, and tensions are running high. So I think we just, I think we were almost like looking into the abyss for a couple of minutes and the Americans in general, which is, which proves to me, we, we can behave ourselves when we, when we should backed away. And there wasn't a lot of violence. I think we were all pleasantly surprised that there weren't shootings of some kind. Which is a sad well, commentary. Well, the other side of the argument is American gun nuts. Uh, I love my democracy. Uh, no. Types of uh, pussies at the end of the day, which is kind of what you expect for people that are covered in tattoos and own a lot of guns. Is really they're cowards and pussies at the are end they, of the day. Are they overcompensating with the? Uh, yeah. the by the time they get the seventh <laughs> or eighth gun, are they? I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just asking a question. Like I've been having these conversations with American gun owners and supporters for decades on podcasts for 15 years right. when they say, well, I said, well, what have you guns? Well, you know, uh, tyranny, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I go, well, what are you waiting for? Your country's been yeah. stolen by a handful of rich oligarchs. Why don't you go and do rise something up. about it? Yeah. Rise up. Yeah. Well, no. yeah. I mean, in theory, uh, we would, but uh, it's not, they're not quite ready yet. It's not quite bad enough. 
yet yeah. for them to actually rise up. They'll march well, in the streets, but in terms of rising up, mm, no, they'll, they'll, they'll yeah. argue about not having to wear a mask, but actually rising up and starting a revolution, they're not quite ready for that. Yeah, well, there was an, an, an 18-year-old who was interviewed in Georgia, young white male, who repeated the refrain, refrain that we've heard for decades, they're going to take my guns, they're going to steal my guns, I've got to vote Republican, I've got to own guns, I've got to protect myself. And I'm like, you know, someone should just set them aside and go, look, you're 18, you don't know much, you haven't been around a long time. But Obama was president for eight years and he had, like you said, the Congress for two years. And at no point was there anything about anybody stealing your guns. It's not going to happen. It's just something they use to get people worked up. And guess what? They sell more guns every time someone yells that out. So it's not real. But the fact that you people keep falling for it one generation after another just shows me that I can't take you seriously because you really think someone's going to kick in your door and come in and take all your guns. It is not going to happen. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so just, I, I had to look up the timeline to uh, remind myself what happens from here. So mm -hmm. December 8th is the deadline, I believe, the safe harbor deadline for states to certify any right. contested results to the Electoral College. Yeah, and that's when, as far as I know, they, that's when they, the states have to officially, or around that time, the states have to officially certify, or sometime around then. And that is when Trump is supposedly going to announce his 2024 candidacy, when uh, Biden is officially certified as the president-elect. So, baby, buckle up. This isn't anywhere near no. over yet. I don't believe there's any way Trump will run again, but uh, Ivanka might, or yeah. Donald Jr. might. Um, or Jared I right. Kushner. Uh, I think yeah. the Trump family will be around unless they all go to jail. I, Trump's too old. He's not going to run again. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't any fun. He did not yeah. have fun. No, he's I don't not think he do had it. fun. No. You're right. But the kids, yeah. the kids might go do it. Uh, and then December 14th is when the Electoral College votes. January 6th, Congress counts the Electoral College votes mm, uh, because. Okay. It takes three weeks to count, uh, you know, up to 270. And then uh, the president well, is sworn in on January 20th. So that's, right. uh, we've got another, what's the date today? 18th of November in Australia. Yeah. So we've got another two months to right. see what happens. And the question is for me, and this is sheer entertainment, it doesn't matter. Will Trump be sitting behind Biden as he takes the oath of office? Because that's what you do. You just, I mean, you could tell Bush, uh, the second Bush, he was miserable and angry when Obama was taking the oath, but he did it. He stood there, he was a stone face. He got through it and he, and he goes off into history books and starts painting. But I don't think, I don't think uh, Trump has the testicular fortitude to sit there and to, you know, go through that, even though it's only like, what, 10 or 20 or whatever minutes it is, I don't think he has what it takes to sit there and endure that. No, no, no way yeah. that he's going to be there for that. Yeah. Let's talk about um, the fact that, uh, I don't know what the number is now, 73 million votes Trump got. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I guess that's the, the big, the big, if there's a big surprise for me out of the yeah. election, apart from no violence, it's the fact that, in 2016, Trump got, I think, 63 million votes. This time I heard he's got 70 million or 73 million. Yeah. I haven't looked at the totals for a couple of days. Yeah. Um, so roughly 10 million more people after four years of Trump yeah. went, yeah. yeah, we want another four years of this. Uh, this I'll is going great. Yeah. 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 Well, let me just say this real quick. Um, we were on, we were doing the Renaissance show. And at one point we were joking around as we are wont to do. And we said, what exactly does the Catholic church have to do to get people to turn away from it? And we mentioned all the horrendous things they've done. What does Trump have to do or say uh, about women or about minorities or violence or uh, both sides had good people, you know, whatever. What does Trump have to do to turn the people away? Because the answer is whatever it is, he hasn't done it yet. And uh, a lot of people, and I'm related to, in fact, most of my family, except for myself and my father, voted for Trump. So whatever he has to do to turn off these people, he hasn't found that line yet. And that's a staggering commentary about American culture at this point. So 
tell me yeah. about your family. I mean, you've you've obviously had conversations with them about this. Why are they voting for Trump? Why did they vote for Trump? Well, first of all, they they uh, they are drinking the Kool Aid. Um, he is he has made America great again. God, some of the stuff I don't want to say just because I get uncomfortable. This is they, a quote. Hold on. Have they drilled yeah, down on how they think it's great to now post Trump after Trump uh, with Trump? I, I, I'm about to do that. And actually, one of the things is something that I agree with. I mean, when Trump came into office, he talked about the endless wars that America has been in. He's actually there was an announcement today, which we're probably going to get into. Uh, uh, he's trying to do something about that. So, you know, good for him. Let's bring our boys home. But anyway, um, trying to avoid war. Um, trying to, how do you put this nicely? Trying to make white people in this country feel like they did in the 1950s that they're back on top. The, the expression that was um, given to me when I hung up the phone was um, the blacks in South Carolina were actually starting to walk around and get a little uppity. And that was just way too much. And Trump is going to do something about that with the uh, the somehow with the culture war in America, but basically whatever Trump says, no matter how outlandish they lap it up, they're not wearing masks. I've got a couple of family members who've got COVID. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are in their seventies and they're and they're dealing with it. They're in the hospital, but just whatever he says, they just they're like absolutely right. This is correct, and so to try to get a coherent response out of them is not really possible. But since there's nothing coherent coming out of Trump. You're not going to get anything coherent out of them because they just repeat everything he says. I'm flat out getting a coherent answer from you about things most of the time. I mean, yeah. my God, I how are you going to get a coherent get answer? I don't know. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I, I, I hear on from Facebook, two people say, well, yeah. the economy's booming under Trump. And I'm like, no, it's not. Where yeah. do you get that idea? Well, the, the NASDAQ's at record levels. Yeah, but that's not a sign of uh, the underlying health of the economy. Your economy is fucked, but it's being propped up, as right. is the Australian economy, I, I uh, would like to add. Yeah. They're both being propped up by modern monetary theory, quantitative easing, just printing money. The US has printed trillions and trillions of dollars yeah. since 2008. This happened uh, under Obama in his two terms, and then it continued mm -hmm. under Trump, escalated under Trump. Just printing money and flooding the economy with free money. You don't yeah. do that if the economy's doing well. You don't, That's you don't have to do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. These are emergency measures. Interest rates are at zero, right. and they're printing trillions of dollars. It's, it's become like, a norm. It's like yeah. It, it, it's like the 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 boat has got. 15 holes in its hull it's flooding right. water and their buckets are just they're just trying to scoop it yeah. they're, they're printing buckets to try and scoop the, the water out before it's and they're calling it a success and they're going well, it's great look at the economy it's great we haven't sunk it have we no therefore heretofore i.e whatever you know term you want to use uh it's not uh sinking but but going back to my my family in south carolina none of them own stocks or bonds and so you can talk about the stock market all you want they're not benefiting from that but they don't but, realize but the economy is great they think it's real unemployment rates are high if you take unemployment and underemployment right. people driving for uber and people involved in the gig economy because they can't Two get full-time work so yeah um so look it's um yeah they're having to work two or three jobs just to uh get by yeah so i i don't know man it's uh yeah but the fact that the that the after four years of trump 70 odd million people wanted to vote for him half of the people who voted yes wanted to yes. chose trump uh it's just indicative to me of um where america's at like the right. the divide is so deep and big and crazy now yeah. but the, I, I, as i keep saying i just can't see how you get out of this i can't see how you get out of the hole right. i think the thing that scares me the most is all those numbers you just gave me about the people that voted for trump they were there all along it's just that a lot of them didn't vote because they couldn't be bothered they're just going on with their life but you get someone who has Obama's skin color in office and suddenly they get all worked up. Someone like Trump runs for office and suddenly people that never voted before or hardly ever voted before uh, will start voting. But the point is, 
those people in their mentality, and they were taught that probably by their parents, and they'll go on and teach their kids the same thing. They were always there. So this country has a long way to go when it comes to race relations. And like you said, because I don't see a way out, we are in for some very hurtful, painful times. It's going to go on for generations because no one knows how to fix it. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there is no... If it's fixable. Yeah. yeah, there is no easy fix for it, I think, at this stage. I mean, I, Biden talking about unity and bringing the country together and governing for Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, good luck with that. I mean, it yeah. sounds nice. I remember Obama said the same thing in 2008 when he got elected. Uh, how did that work out? Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's you can say those sorts of things and it's a nice idea, but... Um, you just yeah. can't, you can't bridge that divide easily. Um, you know, one thing I think he could do that mm -hmm. might help is continue down the MMT path, but instead, instead, sound like a Kiwi then, instead, <laughs> instead of building fish and chips, uh, instead of uh, giving the money that they print right. to corporations and banks who then just typically sit on it, and pay them, yeah. pay their executives massive bonuses. Do what you did a little bit of in the early stages of COVID. Give the money straight to the people. Just put the the, the poorest people in the country yeah. on a, a universal basic income. Yeah. Pay for it via MMT, and uh, just you know buy their love. Just because yes. uh, it's for sale. Yeah, <laughs> it is, it is for sale. but like the, the 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 genuine underlying discontentment that i think the american working class have because they have genuinely been abandoned by the political class over the yes. last 40 yeah, years own. since yes. reagan right. uh and and you know clinton moved the democrats to the right and they've stayed there ever since um, after after Jimmy Carter lost, you know the the uh, inability of both sides to actually address the the genuine issues of the working class, which is a lot of their jobs have been moved to Mexico and China and Vietnam, yeah. and uh, they they they're doing it tough, and no one's really addressing that. So to go well, out very, and you can't, you yeah. can't bring manufacturing back. Like Trump said, it's he was going to bring manufacturing back. You can't coal, do that. Right. Yeah, you can't, you can't do happen. that. Coal, yeah. yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just not going to Tony, happen. Tony said on our QAV show last mm -hmm. week, I think, um, you know, the, the big problem that Biden has is, you know, talking about cleaning up the environment, et cetera, et cetera, getting rid of coal as the coal workers are going, well, what about my fucking jobs? And I said right. to him, it's easy. It's like, we'll just pay you the same salary you're on. We'll pay you that for the rest of your life. And yep. you can find another job or get reskilled too if you want. We'll pay for that. How are we going to yep. pay for it? MMT. Don't worry about it. We're going to just print right. money. It's all good. You don't have to worry about it. Um, well, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I read a very long time ago, and I'm sure this is a very general standard <clears throat> number, but supposedly it, it's um, seven times easier to do something preventative than to actually take care of the problem once the problem arises. So you can, we're, you, like you said, we're printing money. We're just giving it to corporations. We're giving it to other people. Give it to, directly to those coal miners. They don't have to work. They could go to school. They could take classes and learn another thing, but the country's still coming out ahead. You know, And so um, I don't get that we had one stimulus package and that even that was an act of God. We haven't had another one. We're not going to probably get another one, especially if the Republicans hold on to the Senate. And so the idea that these the people in Washington can go, you know what? I care. I, I hear you. I feel your pain. But at no point are we ever going to give you money again. I mean, I mean, what does it take for people to lose their faith or to vote for certain um, Congress people out of office? So again, it's it's the it's the spin it's the lies it's like oh there's problems in Washington it's not me it's all the other people in Washington those are the people that you should be mad at and it's just a it's just a game and a lie that pe keeps getting told every election and it freaking works every time and no one has long term memory. It could it, that could be the solution to the coronavirus thing over there too is if Biden yeah. says we will pay you to wear a mask and yeah. we will pay Stay you home. to go on a lockdown. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if, you know, you, you can prove that you wearing a mask every day right. when you go out in public, we will pay you because yeah. Americans are caught, motivated by money. 
Exactly. If you get caught by the police or whoever without a mask, you don't get your check that month or it gets cut in half or whatever. I mean, money is the end all be all for everybody and everything. And that's just the way it is. And instead of fighting it, let's just use it for right now. By the way, you don't have a right not to wear a mask. You don't like to anyone who still thinks, you know, this is an who listens to this show and thinks this yeah. is an impingement upon your rights. No, you, you don't have a right to endanger the lives of others. Not right. even in that, America. You don't exactly. have that right. That's why that you have illegal. to stop at a stoplight. Right. right? Exactly. exactly. You don't have the right Drive to endanger speed. the lives. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. You don't have the right dangerous. to endanger lives. You live in a society. You choose to live in a society. If you don't yeah. want to lose, live in a society, go off and live in fucking the desert somewhere or the yeah. jungle somewhere. Yeah. If you choose to live in a society with other people, you, are, you, you voluntarily give up certain uh, freedoms like... So being able to drive at any speed you want, wherever you want, whenever you want, right. build your house wherever you want, uh, take a crap on the street if you want. Right. You can't. I tried. The street. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you are voluntarily, this is the social contract, you're voluntarily exactly. giving up certain freedoms in order to live with other people. Because other yeah. people around you are like, well, fuck, we don't want you to do that because it's infringing on our right to have a clean environment or to live safe. Exactly. The same goes with wearing a mask during a pandemic. You don't okay. have the right to say this is to, to endanger the lives of others and say, fuck you. No, you have to do what is right for other people because you live in a society. That's not right. uh, infringing upon your freedoms. Fucking get over yourselves. You idiots. Yeah. Well, let's we talk were, about. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I was moving on. Yeah. 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 Please, please do so. Patrick Gathara, who's a Kenyan political cartoonist, wrote an article in The Guardian, which I related to because it's the same sort of thing I've been talking about forever. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, the final throes of the Trump presidency exposed America as the bad joke and danger to the world it has certainly become. The chaotic US election has undoubtedly been the biggest story in the world in the last two weeks. Watching it unfold from over 13,000 kilometers away in Kenya, the election itself, the long queues, the delayed and disputed vote count, impugned credibility, was disturbingly familiar. Our own elections follow a near identical pattern. The media coverage, not so much. Gone were the condescending tone, the adjective-laden labels, and the expectation of violence and malfeasance so often applied to foreign elections. In yes. its place was an easy familiarity and assumption of competence. The media did not feel it necessary to depict the U.S. as a crisis-wracked, oil-rich, nuclear-armed North American country with armed terror groups roaming at its ethnically polarized, restless interior. But these were yeah. exactly the sorts of descriptors that have traditionally allowed Western audiences to identify with and follow events in distant, exotic places. It seemed right. to me that the rest of us deserved the same consideration, and so I decided to offer this perspective in a Twitter thread. Breaking. After days in barricaded presidential palace, U.S. dictator Donald Trump hesitantly emerges to attend ceremony for fallen troops in coastal capital, Washington, D.C. Race is now on to get back to the palace before President-elect Joe Biden can sneak in and depose him. Yeah. Uh, breaking. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden, soon to be perhaps the oldest leader in the G20, is calling up his younger counterparts around the world for assistance in throwing babyish incumbent autocrat Donald Trump out of the presidential palace wherein he has barricaded himself. Breaking. Following intense pressure from the AU, British strongman Boris Johnson calls US President-elect Joe Biden with an offer to send troops under the rubric of Western solutions for Western problems to help secure its troubled former colonies transition to democracy. <laughs> Breaking yeah. rumors hotly denied by regime officials are spreading that U.S. dictator Donald Trump, who has not been seen in public since he returned to the barricaded presidential palace days ago, may have fled the crisis-torn republic for asylum in an undisclosed country. Um, but then yeah. he gets on in the article and he says, in truth, it has been a long time coming. For a long time, America has been to the world what Trump has been to America, a bull in a china shop. Rich, entitled, brash, overconfident, and often downright stupid, 
Since the end of the Cold War, the country has traipsed around the world, breaking stuff as it went, throwing its weight around and playing fast and loose with cherished global norms. Its journalists and movie makers and president rarely missed the opportunity to stress just what an uncivilized shithole the rest of the globe was and how much we needed the enlightenment offered by the Peace Corps. Uh, America always seemed surprised that other people did not necessarily appreciate being insulted or told how to live. So, look, and look, I, I relate to all of this. I mean, he's he's oh, having yeah. a go, but um, it's true. That's how I've seen America, and I think a lot of people, yeah, in the Western world, see America. Uh, well, around the world, outside of America, see the world. It's just this. And I, my only argument with his thing is it didn't start after the end of the Cold War. Obviously, it's been going on. I, you know, at least since the end of World War Two, and a little bit before that as well. You go back to you know the takeover of the Philippines and the supporting of dictators in the early part of the 20th century, like yeah. Batista and Cuba, et cetera, et cetera. Well, like you said, um, I can't remember where, because we, you, we've been talking to each other for seven years. Um, America economically had its heyday after World War II. And, and when you have economic affluence, uh, like, like uh, Florence uh, during the uh, Medici time, you can get away with a lot of things. And so, when I was reading those tweets, some of those you just read, if you take out the names in the countries, it sounds like you're talking about a country and an election in Africa or maybe in Southeast Asia or something like that. But no, it was America. And that hit me because it's like, oh my God, is that how other countries see us? Because it's like, oh my God, the guy down the street is hitting his wife. What a horrible man. Well, yeah, I hit my wife, but it's different because it's me and she had it coming. We can't judge ourselves. We can't find ourselves um, failing in any way, but uh, people put up with us because we, like you said, we've uh, lorded it over the world for decades after World War II. We got a ton of money. We've got the biggest army in the world. And now that we're falling apart and now that our democratic institutions, which really haven't meant that much to us for a couple of, of decades. And now they're being tested with the economic crisis and the pandemic. You're really getting to see what America is made of as far as its institutions and its people. And it's not that impressive, but you can't tell Americans anything about themselves because we automatically still assume we're superior to everyone else. So it's literally, we're gonna go down sinking with the ship and not realize that it's sinking because it, something like that could never happen to us it's the immediate, sad. Yeah, yeah and and i'm sure all failing states and empires tend to think that way um, exactly. but the thing that i've always found fascinating is not only do americans think they're superior to the rest of the world they think the rest of the world thinks you're superior yes, to the rest of the yes. world too how many times have you heard uh whoever the president of the united states is is the leader of the free world and the rest of you are going to the fuck are you talking about i didn't vote for you like yeah what yeah the fuck are you talking but about we assume everybody looks to us all the time for guidance even moral examples yeah even biden's been saying that in his speeches in the last couple yeah. of weeks he's been saying it's time for that. america to return back that. to being the leader of the free world no we it's love not that. we're no yeah. you're not yeah <laughs> Well, and so we, I, I got yeah. into that argument with Markham uh, a while back, and he said, I, I said, we didn't vote for you. Get off your fucking high, whatever it is that you want. We and can't. he said, uh, well, if it's not America, who do you think is the leader of the free world? I said, there isn't one, you no. fucking idiot. Like, there is yeah. no leader of the free world. I mean, what are you talking about? That's no. a, it's American wet dream. It's something that Americans invented and jerk off over themselves late at night about, but Even it's not a day. thing. It's never been right. a thing. We think it is because why we invented it. That's why. But see, here's the thing. You were talking a second ago about Australia maybe needs to realize that it's actually in Asia. Well, here's the thing. The thing about America is that there's two things. You can hate us or you can do whatever, but one, we have the ability to print a lot of money and we keep doing that. And two, we have the world's largest military, but like the Roman empire, we can't be taken out by another country, but we can implode. We can erode our own foundations on our own base and we can fall apart internally. And that's exactly what we're doing now, but we still refuse to see it because we are the greatest that's ever been, maybe even ordained by God. And when you have that mentality, you can't see your own faults. So you don't try to fix your own faults. But the Roman Empire was taken down by another country. Right. But after, after you know, uh, 
it goes from a republic to an empire and there's a lot of civil wars and, there's, and it weakens itself. And so it was get addable after it became a lot weaker than what it was. And we're going to see what happens to America. Get, get addable. Get addable. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. That was an yeah. FDR expression. He said really? about Stalin. He said, he said, Stalin is get addable. You just got to know wow. how to talk to him. Yeah. Churchill couldn't get anywhere with him, but FDR could because he knew how to play the game. He was a consummate yeah. politician. Get addable. And he was nice addible. to him. Like he treated him like a human with being. They were exactly with respect. Yeah. They were friendly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, all right. Uh, how are we doing with time? We've got a little bit of time. So let me let me move to beating up on Australia now for a second. Um, <laughs> in the, and then we'll get back to beating up on America. In the news this week, the Australian federal government has just settled in court, uh, were, uh, agreed to a settlement worth $1.2 billion Ooh, the after a, a class action lawsuit. It, it had something called the robo-debt recovery scheme. Right. It was basically computerized phone calls of people telling them they owed the government money. And uh, 370,000 people were wrongly pursued by the government. What is Australia's population? Roughly? 20, 26, 27 million. Okay, 300,000 people got the call. All right. Yeah. Just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, so the government rolled this thing out, like terrorized. And I know of, I know at least one young person who committed suicide after he got this oh, call from the government Jesus. saying that he owed them tens of thousands of dollars, which he didn't owe them. Um, so I, I, I wanted to point this out because just because governments do it doesn't necessarily mean it's legal or moral right. or ethical. Right. And so we need to can constantly push back on things that our governments are doing that we think yeah. are uh, certainly illegal uh, and even unethical or immoral. And governments yeah. will uh, try and present themselves as uh, being the good guys. And that's not the first time this current Australian government mm -hmm. has been uh, censured by the courts for doing illegal stuff. They were raiding the homes of journalists a couple of years ago. They got into trouble for that that yeah, they're uh you know doing this kind of crazy shit which they yes. you know they crack cracking down cracking down right. on dull bludgers welfare bludgers um so uh you know i just think this is indicative of the kind of mindset that we have in governments around the world now like you would think before you're rolling out a program of any kind uh, mm -hmm. as a government you're stress testing the legality, the morality, the the ethical nature of it, putting strict measures into place that this Oversight. is going to be the right thing for the people. Oversight, exactly. Yeah. Um, obviously, did not only did they not do that in this case, it took them right. four years to be Jeez. held to account for it and to right. agree to the settlement and apologize for it. Um, no one's lost their job uh, over it. Yeah. Uh, no one's been punished by the government for it. It's just, you know, we'll just write a check and we'll get out of jail free here on this. Um, you know, it, it, it'll be forgotten by the time we have another election because of my next story, which is about the inquiry that several of our former prime ministers are trying to get up, two of them, uh, mm -hmm. into Rupert Murdoch's control of the media in Australia. Right. So Kevin Rudd, who was our prime minister, Brisbane boy, was our prime minister from 2007 till 2010. And then again, from, I think, 2013 to 2014 or something. Right. Um, he, uh, he just raised um, over 5,000 signatures on a petition to try and force the government to uh, hold an inquiry into media ownership in this country, particularly with a focus on uh, the Murdoch media. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been joined by Malcolm Turnbull, who was our prime minister for a few years. I, I don't exactly remember the dates, but in recent times. Um, he... Uh, He's a, a rich lawyer, used to be the lawyer of one of the media um, barons in Australia, mm. a guy called Kerry Packer. 
where he got his start. Yeah. And then he owned an internet company that I worked for for quite a few years. Um, he's joined the ball, uh, the, the the call for this as well. I'm just trying to find the um, article I've got on this for some reason. Yeah, it's I saw the video up. of Malcolm Turnbull that you sent me. And by the end, I was standing up cheering, going, oh, my God, someone's finally saying something. I don't know if it's going to do any good. Probably not. But it felt great to watch. Him yeah, he was. That guy. He was on a TV show here called Q&A um, mm -hmm. that is yeah, sort of like a question and answer show. They get politicians and business people and leading thinkers. It's, so they haven't had me on yet, surprisingly. Um, so it's not that good. Not that good, you know, but, you know, it's, I'm too good. Well, I'm too good for it. Right. I think I is... Yeah. I think is the issue here, like most things, you know, they, they look right. at me and they're like, oh, she's too good for this show. Can't handle uh, he wrote a book, Turnbull, earlier in the year where he basically called News Corp uh, a political party with a, with a media arm so mm. or that owns a bunch of journalists or something like right. that. Because it, it basically does have a massive influence on politics in this country as it does in the US and also the UK. And so there is finally an inquiry, an attempt to get an inquiry. It hasn't, the government hasn't agreed to it yet. They wow. will fight it tooth and nail. And yeah. according, and Michael, uh, sorry, so fucking Malcolm Turnbull was the leader of the party that is currently in government here. Right. And he, uh, he got knifed uh, by his own party, by the guy who is now uh, the, the prime minister. I remember that. And, um, uh, he, uh, Turnbull, this is, has said that the current government, his own old party, mm -hmm. is basically in partnership with Rupert Murdoch and, uh, you know, does whatever he tells them to do because they don't want Murdoch to squeeze them out of power, yeah. which has been the truth of every government in this country for decades uh they all when they get into power they first phone call they make is to rupert murdoch <laughs> to thank him for his support in the election uh to i'd like get to thank you for this opportunity yeah you know. yeah <laughs> to get their marching orders uh right. what do you want me to do okay rupert that's power and then uh, when they start to do stuff that he doesn't like he turns on them and has them right. replaced or at least tries Jeez. to have them replaced um, with you know, he, he, he tried and failed in our recent Queensland election to have the Queensland uh, Premier and government replaced, but failed. Mm. Um, so he's not always successful, but uh, successful Enough. more often than not. So yeah. that's going on here, and uh, uh, hopefully, it will uh, you know, we will get an inquiry, but it's probably too little, too late. I mean, Rupert's yeah. 150. Uh, he's going to die. I don't think, well, one of his sons has left the business recently, Lock, um, James. I think right. Lachlan is still there, but I don't think Lachlan's really as right wing uh, as his father is. I, I think, um, you know, you've started to see a bit of a change in tone from Fox News uh, mm -hmm. in terms of their relationship with Trump since the oh, election. Yes. I th think some of that has to do with the power shift in the Murdoch family and how that's playing mm -hmm. out in News Corp. But, uh, yeah, Malcolm Turnbull has accused Prime Minister Scott Morrison of working as a team with News Corp newspapers and Sky TV. The former Prime Minister has joined Kevin Rudd in backing a petition for a royal commission into media diversity and the role of Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, which they both believe is a malevolent and partisan force in Australian political life. And, of course, I would say to both of them, well, why the fuck didn't you do something about it when you ran the government it's not Thank like you. you didn't know this was going on right. then because i knew it was going on i'm sure you yeah. knew it was going on it's a bit yeah. fucking late to do it when you're out of power you know do it when you're in power but of course they don't want to do it when they're in power because they don't want to be out of power and they don't want Rupert exactly to turn on them. Yeah. Well, you and I talked about the uh, lack of intestinal or testicular fortitude when it comes to politicians for someone to go, you know what? I, yeah, I'd like to stay in office. I love all the perks. I love the attention and I love the security and I love all the benefits that come with it. Like when Trump got COVID rushed to Walter Reed hospital, best doctors in the world, the whole thing. 
some politician needs to go, you know what, I'm going to fall on my sword. I'm going to take Murdoch on. I might go down. I probably will go down, but I'm going to go after his ass. No one does that because that's not human nature. You, you, like you said, you do whatever you got to do to stay in office. And if that's kiss that old man's ass, that's what you do. And so when you come out and you rail against him, yeah, we like to hear the words, but it's not nearly as impressive as you think it is because like you said, you had your chance and you muffed it. And one, one of the things I learned from the West Wing is mm-hmm. that, you know, I think the way that they justify that to themselves is, well, yes. e, if it's better for us to stay in power, if we have to compromise our principles, better for us to stay in power. because so they're not in power. So they're yeah. not in power, A, and B, we can at least do some good stuff. Yeah. I think so there was an episode in right. one of the early West Wing episodes where they were talking yeah. about, gun yeah. control a gun control that, bill and it. they they yeah. backed off on it because they were like well you know yeah. too many Can't democrats will here. lose their seats exactly. and yeah you know, better that we compromise but we stay in power and we can do some good somewhere yeah. um and yeah so which keep collecting a check yeah sorry go ahead yeah i mean and that's a reasonable argument to make i guess but unless uh, you want to put your country first well, consequently, the big things don't get done That's true. because no one has the balls to stake their, you know, pol- the, the political future of their yeah. party on it. You have to go know. and get a real job. <laughs> Who wants that? Yeah. You want to talk about America or hate crimes, Ray? Yes, I think you're going to be shocked shocked uh, that hate crimes in the United States have risen to their highest levels in in, uh, more than a decade as federal officials also record the highest number of hate motivated killings since the FBI started gathering this information in the 1990s. So um, let's see if I, let me just give you some numbers. I know numbers can be dry, but we are talking about hate crimes here. Trump has been in office for the last four years with the various things that he's espousing. Let's see here. So there was 7,314 hate crimes last year in 2019. In 2018, there was 7,120. So it it ticked up a little bit. Uh, In 2008, there were 7,783. So it kind of goes down back uh, after 2008, but it comes back up. And to make everything nice and simple, the FBI um, defines hate crimes as those that are motivated um, against a person based on their race, religion, sexual orientation, or that kind of thing. So um, hate crimes are up more than they've been or equal to what they were 10 years ago. Uh, hate crimes against Jews and Jewish institutions are up. Um, I think it's gone from uh, 953 crimes to, it was 835 crimes in 2018, and now it's 935. So it's gone up 100 more last year. And this was all before COVID, just when Trump was espousing things and getting people worked up. Uh, uh, This one, I was a little surprised about. Hate crimes against African Americans actually dropped a little bit in 2019. Uh, There were 1,930 versus the 1,943 in uh, 2018. So the good news is that Crimes against Blacks have come down a little bit, but because we are talking about Trump, uh, hate crimes against Hispanics have jumped up. It went from 485 uh, incidents in 2018 to 527. And even that I thought was a low number considering all the things that he's been spewing over for the last four years. But here's the thing, so few agencies police agencies and whatnot report their information to the FBI. This is kind of like the coronavirus. We need as much detailed information as we can get because with more information, we can get a better evaluation of the problem and better and uh, more accurate ways to fix it. So the FBI will keep putting out these numbers, but such a small percentage of the various law enforcement agencies around the country um, actually report their numbers to the FBI. I think it's like 200 2,172 uh, agencies out of the 15,000 that are out there. So a lot of this stuff just doesn't get reported. And as such, the FBI can't do much about it. So again, it's just another one of those institutions in America that really needs to be focused on. It really needs a lot more resources and it needs the support of the White House that it has not been getting for the last four years. And it's not going to for a while, but now even with Biden in the office, we've got such other bigger problems. We can't focus on something like this um, that needs clearly needs to happen because I don't know about you, Cam, but I really do think 
that a civil war of some kind and some scope and whatever you want to call it is going to happen in this country. It's just a matter of when and how it gets started. And it's things like hate crimes that will help trigger that. And if we could get those under control, that might help a lot, but that is probably not going to happen. So a couple of things there. Yeah. You said that there were seven odd thousand hate crimes last year but yeah. only 10% roughly of the uh, law enforcement agencies are reporting. Exactly. So, so the number 70, I don't do math. Yeah. Is it 70,000 yeah, probably? Yeah. The number is yeah. probably uh, more like 70,000. Yeah. So that's one point. Second point is um, it's growing. And yes. why do you think it's growing though? Honestly, um, as an American, why do you think hate crimes are going up? Well, here, here's the best I can do. All I can do is give you anecdotal. My father is from Nelson County, Virginia, where I live right now. My mother's from Charleston, South Carolina, and they both were raised to not think of blacks as equals. Um, just I'm putting that out there. That's just a blunt statement. However, my dad, as a young man, went into the Air Force um, because he wanted to get out of Nelson County. Uh, he got tired of cows. And he, he traveled the world and he saw a lot of different things and he mixed with a lot of different people. And I think that that exposure to different cultures, different people, different locations, probably re-educated or changed his thinking when it comes to people who are not white. So we weren't raised hearing the N-word. We weren't raised with all these uh, uh, assumptions or, or stereotypes or whatever. Now, pretty much everybody all my, all my father's brothers and sisters, all my mom's brothers and sisters have raised their kids to use the N word like it's no big deal um, to have all these horrible attitudes. It just didn't happen to us for whatever reason. So it's still prevalent. It's still being passed on from generation to generation. And that is the best answer I can give you. It's not going, the problem is not going anywhere. The root causes of ignorance and assumption and being passed from one generation to another is not really changing. And so why should it get better when no, when the root cause of it is not being altered in any way? That's probably the best I can do. Okay, but that that uh, would be ev uh, an explanation for why racism mm -hmm. is not going away. But there's, there's a leap between racism and a hate crime. Attacking uh... someone because of their race or religion or sexuality, you know, why, why is that going up? Why are people, well, why is crime, like crime is going down around right. the world. We, we, we've done shows on this, right? Yes. yes. Crime rates are going down around the world. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for potential reasons for that levels of education yeah. and literacy, yeah. uh, you know, economic, uh, 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 rising rates of, of, of you know, people out of poverty and that kind of stuff. So yeah. crime is going down, but hate crimes are going up in America. It's, that's a strange data yeah. point. Well, it, yes and no. If you let's say for a second that racism, and we are talking about racism, not hate crimes. Let's say racism is going, it's chugging along steady as can be. You know, it's not, it's not really diminishing. If someone comes along and tells you the reason this country is having the problems it is now is because a bunch of brown people are coming here illegally from the south now it doesn't matter that they're escaping horrible conditions that some part in some part american foreign policy has helped create it doesn't matter if a bunch of people are trying to come into america and they're taking our jobs and they're getting benefits and they're getting free schooling and free lunch programs and all that stuff and you're not getting it because they're getting it that pisses people off or you tell or like <laughs> The person in my family in South Carolina said, you know, the blacks, they're getting uppity. I mean, it used to, they used to know their place and everything was fine and we could live with that. But now they're getting uppity and they're expecting to be treated as equals. Someone needs to do something about it. Uh, I don't want to put it all on Trump, obviously, because that's not true. But he has been saying, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that are going on. It's not your fault. It's other people's faults and they're, and they're not white. And gosh darn it, maybe somebody should do something about it the best i can do right well it, this story prompted me to look up what's going on with gun violence in the u.s because mm. 
you know, Chrissy and I have, uh, we were wondering aloud about this a couple of weeks ago saying, I haven't yeah. heard of any mass shootings during COVID in the US. Yeah. Did maybe one of the upsides uh, yeah. of COVID has been a reduction in violence and a reduction in mass shootings. Thank you, uh, unfortunately, that, well, no, don't, no. don't, uh, don't, uh, don't get too excited. Don't, just don't, Ray. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> According to the Gun Violence Archive that right. tracks uh, thousands of news sources around the country to put together uh, a list of gun violence and mass shootings and that kind of stuff, gun violence yeah. is uh, at a record high this year. Oh, 2020. Uh, All right. Yeah. Well, if you look at even just by now, right, we're uh, middle of November 2020. Right. There have been... 567 mass Jeez. shootings in the United States. Um, in 2019, wow. there were 417. So, uh, yeah, in 2018, there were 337. So, so <laughs> mass we shootings. We can't leave each other alone during a pandemic. We have yeah. to find a, first of all, you're not supposed to be going out your house. They're going out with their guns and they're shooting people. I mean, what the hell? Yeah. What the actual hell? So that's mass shootings, not mass murders, right? right. It's uh, different. Right. There have been 16 mass murders in the country so far. I don't have a stat for mass mm -hmm. murders from last year. Um Suicide numbers, uh, surprisingly, uh, seem to be a little bit down uh, compared to the last few years. But again, the year isn't out yet. Looks like it may not jump up too much. But um, total deaths, uh, all causes from gun violence are up. This is uh, homicide, murder, unintentional and suicide combined right. are, um, you know, up way up uh this year in the u.s so uh you know we haven't had any big mass shootings reported in the news here are, are you yeah. familiar with any big mass shootings over there like a mass shooting i think the fbi says it's like five people i think in uh, five yeah. uh, victims is that well, so, yeah your understanding like, i mean we did it when we did our gun show number, but, right know. Well, first of all, you can't get more than 15 people together or the number keeps changing and it depends on what it is, whether it's a school or a church or a restaurant or whatever. So it's kind of a little bit difficult to have really big shootings if a whole lot of people aren't gathered together. But the fact that we still managed to kill more people than we did last year, um, fucking USA, I don't know. <laughs> it's just another one of those indicators that we've kind of lost our way morally. And well, I don't know. We're a very angry, tense society with a lot of guns. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. I thought uh, maybe those numbers would have, uh, would have been a good year for uh, a reduction yes. in mass shootings, yeah. but apparently not the case. Does that, does that mean shooters have to work harder since there's smaller, fewer, large groups of people? Do they actually have to do more to, to increase that number from last year? They yeah. I mean, dedicated dedicated so, to their craft yeah yeah, Jeez. yeah. <clears throat> well i feel better it's, it's a sad statistic uh just i gotta finish because i've got an italian lesson i gotta get to yeah. in a few minutes but yeah. um trump in iran you sent me this story donald trump uh, has been thinking about bombing iran i don't buy this I don't buy this. Trump was told that um, they had moved some centrifuges. I'm trying to remember uh, from stuff that was above ground to underground. And so the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, well, can we bomb these places? Can we, is there anything in Iran that we can bomb? Can we go after it? But I really don't, I don't buy this because one, he's been talking about endless wars. And two, today he actually said from, um, he put out the order that is it Afghanistan and Iraq, I'm trying to remember the other country. God, that's sad. Yeah, he's he pulling said, troops out of Iraq pulling, and Afghanistan. He, goes, he only yeah. wants 2,500 troops in each. Other than that, everybody comes home. So he says, okay, well, maybe we can bomb something to do something about um, Iran. So he has his advisors sit down. They go through the options. They go, well, we can bomb this. We can do this. On the other hand, that might uh, incite a 
territorial or, or a, a regional conflict that might blow up and then suddenly we can't take any of our troops out. So I don't know if he was just doing that to be tough. I don't know if he was doing that uh, sincerely or if he just wanted to kind of freak Iran out because clearly he doesn't like Iran. But the idea of wanting troops to get out to, to no longer have wars, but to bomb Iran at the same time, I don't know, in, in my head doesn't compute, but it's Trump. So anything is possible. Who well, what do you bombing think someone doesn't necessarily involve boots on the ground, right? No, he doesn't want boots on the act. ground. Well, yeah. maybe they will. They didn't when he assassinated Soleimani earlier this they, year. They did drop a couple of bombs inside Iraq. and Because um, there was a big thing about where he said no one got killed, but supposedly there were some injuries. It wasn't a massive retaliation on Iran's part, but the point is the potential's there. So who in the hell knows? And I think they hit a base uh, where, and after they gave a warning, we're going to hit a base yes, and everyone yes. was able to evacuate the base. They knew what they were doing, yeah. Yeah, but I think the issue that prompted this latest thing is that it was reported that Iran has 2.4 ton of low enriched uranium. They, right. The deal that they had with the Obama administration was they wouldn't go above 202 kilograms. They've now got 2.4 ton. They can say, fuck you, you're the ones who backed out of the deal. We can do what we want. That's right. Uh -huh. So the US backed out of the deal. Iran said, well, the deal's off. The rest of the world tried to get them to stick to the deal. And they were like, well, what's the, the point if, if America's backed out of the exactly. deal? Exactly. Um, and we've talked about Iran and their nuclear program in the past. I mean, there has never been any evidence that Iran is trying to build nuclear weapons. Uh, American administrations and Israeli administrations for decades have been saying there's some good YouTube compilations of this of Benjamin Netanyahu saying, you know, Iran will have nuclear weapons within two years. And he's yes. been saying that every for year for like, time. yeah, yes. 20 years. Right. And uh, they, still they still don't. And in fact, uh, the Ayatollah has said that nuclear weapons are forbidden to mm -hmm. Muslim people. The country is forbidden to develop them. They're anathema to uh, Islam. You can't have them. They do, are trying to build nuclear power right? Uh, because difference. they want to disconnect themselves from you know, needing to rely on oil. Yeah. But uh, obviously there is some uh, uh, concern in the global community that they're trying to build nuclear weapons. Now, of course, I always say, well, fucking everyone else has nuclear weapons. Why can't Iran have nuclear weapons? What's Iran ever done to right. put itself in a situation where it's not allowed to have nuclear weapons? It's the victim, not the aggressor. It was right. America that overthrew Iran's government in 1953. It was America who funded and supported Saddam Hussein in, well, after they kicked out the government, they installed the Shah, who ran right. a brutal dictatorship. When Iran got rid of the Shah, their own government, they did a coup of their own government. Right. Uh, then America funded and supported Saddam Hussein to invade Iran mm -hmm. using chemical weapons that America sold him, uh, ended in the deaths of millions and millions of Iranians. Then America put Iran under economic sanctions, which they've been under for decades, which has crippled their economy, destroyed the lives of millions of people, and right. probably enabled the Ayatollah and the, the religious theocracy to survive and prosper over there because they're able to position the US as uh, you know the great enemy that they have a religious war with. Right. Um, so what's a, what's Iran done exactly why to, to justify why it can't have nuclear weapons to defend itself from aggression? I, don't know. I, I think you're asking the question in the wrong way. If, if they do get nuclear weapons, we can't push them around anymore. And who wants that? So yes, no weapons for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, as we know, because we've done lots of shows on this, the U.S.'s policy for many decades now has been to destabilize the Middle East yeah. by trying to put this, the, the Sunni against the Shia and the Sunni and the Shia against Israel and to keep them right. all at odds with each other. Um, so they're yeah. too busy fighting each other 
to collaborate and lock down, you know, oil prices and you know, or, or increase oil prices as they yeah. did in 1973. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of political stuff at play here, and the the, the stories that we get fed by the mainstream media and by the governments are, is yeah. mostly propaganda. Right, and and. I was just going to say real quick, I know you got to go, the idea of having internal troubles in another country to keep them busy so they can't hurt you, that's as old as time itself. However, at some point, these people figure out what you're doing, and then they dedicate themselves to taking you down, and we call them terrorists, but I'm sure they would call themselves something else. Yeah, well, um, when he uh, sort of developed this policy for the Middle East, Henry Kissinger quoted Cardinal Richelieu and how he was able to keep uh, the German uh, nobility fighting each other. Uh, right. That was his strategy, you know, get them to fight each other and they won't yeah. be able to unify. So, yeah, Kissinger, yeah. you know, developed it. Oh, my Italian guy's trying to call me. All right. Bye, everybody. I talk to you next time, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Woo. All right. Uh, I got to talk to you later. I have some questions. So I'll, uh, I'll send you an email and we can talk later. Okay. All right. See ya. Bye-bye.